Hi, I'm Andres, and uh, I work at Second Quadrant, and I spent the last two years working on the feature uh, on the wall here, and I think it's very helpful for and good part for Postgres, so I'm going to try to explain why I did it, what it does, and how you can use it. And as you might notice from the initial slide, the feature went to quite a bit of different names. I think I initially named it logical replication, then I renamed it myself to change set extraction. Then I think Robert suggested logical decoding, I don't remember who, then the marketing material now names it data change streaming. MS SQL name has it as change data capture and another unnamed database has it at streams. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. And what is that uh, feature with the many name? What it allows us to do is to get all modifications performed to a database. That is to say, insert, update, delete, in a format that you can use for other things. And the important part is, is it's doing that in an order that's consistent. And that what a consistent order means, if you take all those changes, put them into another database, you will be able to replay them. It won't be like a random order so you don't get uniqueness conflicts or similar things. And what's also very important, and that was a very crucial thing during the whole discussion on the list, initially it was all hard-coded and the output that comes out of the whole feature is completely configurable. You can make it do anything. And what's also, what I found very important is it's possible to do that, to use the whole feature even if you do all stuff like auto table, drop table, because that's where the existing logical replication solutions for Postgres like Sloney, like Londiste, like Cardo, they all have big, big problems with that and they break. And users strangely don't like that very much. And it is very low overhead in comparison to the existing solutions. The existing solutions basically created triggers for every action and queued all the changes into a queue table and that meant at least the double amount of writes and the double amount of write ahead log, and that's uh, relatively expensive. And it got even more expensive if you have that stuff like a timestamp data type, float data type, because converting the binary representation of timestamp to a text is very expensive. So just to start off, how to actually use the feature, the, a very important concept in the whole thing is replication slots. And that's basically one stream of the data can be streamed from one slot. And so what I'm doing here, I'm doing saying select star from PG create logical replication slot. What that does, it creates one replication stream and my stream is named my stream and the output format will be determined by the second parameter how that exactly works, I'll come back to in a second. And then it gives you back what it did. So, and we have a nice overview over which replication slots are already created. And that's the PG replication slot view. And that just shows you all the uh, registered slots. And obviously, in this example, I had only created one. There's also all the kinds of slots, but I'm not going to take, talk about those today. So what happens if I actually do things, do perform DDL? So let's say I have a, a table talks. I create a table. The talk name is the primary key because I don't dislike surrogate keys. And there's the description. I insert a talk into the talk table, and that's the select star from changes table uh, talk and the description is, explains what logical decoding is. And then to show off that it actually works with DDL, I'm going to add a new column and I'm going to update the column to uh, add a and review for my talk, which is to say whatever, and then I'm going to drop the table. And now, I want to get all those changes. And there's a very simple way to do that, for which is very useful for many things, and that's the PG logical slot get changes function. And that is a set returning function, 
and that just returns all the changes that happen since the last time it has been called. And if that, I call that on the replication slot stream I previously created, that's the my stream thing, and I'll, I only want the location and the data column that it is returning, and then it will show the changes that happened. So the first transaction, the first data modification that happened was the insert. So we see that there is an insert to the table. The column talk name of type text is select star from changes. The description is explains logical decoding. And then you can see there's a commit of that transaction. And later, we, if you recall correctly, the, we did, uh, updated the table and added the review column and filled it with text. So now we updated the table and there's the text. But if you look closely, there's also the XID column, uh, the, the number of the commit, and there's a gap in between. That's where I did the alter table, because at the moment we only decode the changes to the table, not changes to the table structure. So it didn't fit on the slide, but there's an empty transaction in between here. So, and how is data flowing in this? When we have the database, and then the data flows from there to a so-called output plugin. That was the test underscore decoding I had. And if I have several output sl uh, replication slots, it will just do the same thing. Every replication slot can have a different output plugin, and that will then go to the user or the consumer or another database or similar. So, and output plugins are what determine how the data that will output look like. So, the idea for, of output plugins is that I want the logical replication to only stream the data in the most efficient format, that's Postgres internals format. The Sloney people, for example, want the, have a compatible, compatible format with the old data. Other people want to have SQL because they want to just replay that into a very another database, and SQL is the simplest for that. And there's lots of different things you can imagine to Sometimes you only need the primary key and nothing, not the actual table data. We want that all co configurable. But since we didn't want to add all the uh, format where we added, need to add a myriad of options, we said that's user-defined code, and that user-defined code can then form the, the data itself. And that works by uh, getting a couple, an output plugin consists of a couple of callbacks. There's one callback that gets called if uh, the plugin should be initialized. And then the important things are every time a transaction is decoded, there's the begin callback call that at first. Then for every single change that happens in that transaction, be it an insert, be it an update, be it a delete, uh, the change callback. What it's called. Even if you delete 100,000 rows at once by doing a delete, the change callback will be called 100,000 times for every single row. And then if you commit, uh, the commit will be replayed. If you look closely, there's no abort record here, and no abort callback here. That's because aborted transactions are never ever decoded. You can't look at aborted data here. It's only once the commit happened in the source data, only then you can get the contents of the transaction. And then if we stop uh, doing the decoding thing, a shutdown callback is called. That's usually only used to free memory and similar things. And what's very interesting is that during the whole, when it, whenever a change callback is called, you have act uh, access to the transaction that is forming the action, so you know this transaction has this XID, it committed at this timestamp, which is something you could never ever do before, and it will ever get also ways get called in the order that the commits happen internally. The, it might be different to the perceived commit order from the user, where, because sometimes the network might be slower for one connection than the other. And there's already a couple of output plugins the, build, the com original commit uh, had included the test decoding plugin. That's the output you saw earlier. That includes the column name, that includes the column type, and has a text format. 
Admittedly, that's not very useful for everyone, but it's very useful for testing because it shows most of the information that's available. Then uh, Euler Tavera, -Tave I can't spell the name, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> has written an uh, output plugin that outputs JSON, and that's already quite useful. I think there's a fair amount of discussion to be had about in which way the database changes reflect the, in the JSON. I'm not 100% happy with the output format there. I think we want, probably want a JSON format in core, in my opinion, but I think it has to look a bit different. And Michael Pakir, who is unfortunately not here, has written an output plugin that just uh, does everything as SQL statements. So if you update a row, you get an update. And, but that means if you had originally one update statement updating the whole table, you now get one update statement for every single row because everything is row-based here. So is the plugin uh, formatting the output and that gets stored in the catalog? No. So um, the way it works is the data is initially only stored inside the write ahead log of Postgres. Okay. It never ever, the output plugin gets never called before it's in the, inside the write ahead log. The output plugin gets called, uh, gets as an argument the heap tuple type of Postgres, which is just the internal representation of data. And you don't need, really need to know where it's coming from, but every time it gets streamed out, it gets converted in you. There's no like caching of anything going on, it just gets streamed out. Uh, the, so the replication slots, that was the one thing we cre in the select star from PG replication slots, they, they, re they are there to reserve resources we still need. If there's a checkpoint and that checkpoint would remove write ahead log that's uh, still needed by the uh, rep logical replication, it will say, oh, I can't remove that, I'll reserve it. And the same mechanism is now used, can be used for normal streaming replication. So you can just have a slot that says you can't remove any write ahead log that's still needed by a standby. So that's the reason these slots actually exist, is just to reserve resources we need for some form of replication. Is there any monitoring so you can tell? Yes, um, so unfortunately I think. Uh, so there's additional columns there that say like the, the last uh, data that's required is this LSN, and then that you can monitor. Is that plugin column just a label for your use, or does that determine what the database is? So the, the, that's the base name of a uh, for shared object. So what it does, it creates, when you say, create a replication slot with test decoding, what it looks for is in, in libdir, the a shared object that has libdir, and then has, has, has uh, one callback that loads the configuration basically you say says those callbacks exist and that's those are the function pointers and then gets initialized. That is explained in the documentation. I don't think it's particularly interesting, but yeah. So but if you you might say, so what if my table doesn't have a primary key? Or what if I also want the whole old version of the row because I want to compute differences between rows. There's the new fe feature that's called the replica identity. You can say alter table, replica identity, and there's these options. If you set it to default, if the table has a primary key, then that's output for available for the output plugin when you do an update. If it's set to, if there's no primary key, you won't have access to the old version of the row, but the new version of the row is available. Then what you also can do is to say, I want explicitly want to use another index as the identity. Often enough, you have several indexes on your table, and they like one ID column and also the username. And the username is also not null, and it's also unique. So you can say, my external solution doesn't care about the internal ID, I want the username. Then just say the username underscore IDX, and it will use that from there on. Then you can say, I want the full row. That's obviously going to need a bit more space in the write ahead log. 
because suddenly you need to store in an update the old version and the new version. But it also might be that in your use case, you only need the new version because the old data doesn't care, you don't care about it. So you can just say nothing and then the overhead will be a bit lower. Uh, and what might be important, uh, interesting there is that if you update a row and the, you have set it to default or using index and there's no change in the primary key, we won't actually send, uh, store the primary key again because we can just get it from the new tuple because it will be there. So and what do I, we think is this going to be useful for? The primary reason I want, we want this is replication. Currently, if you use streaming replication, you can't have any write activity on the standby, which is fine for many use cases. For high availability, you fail over, that's okay. But you can't create temporary tables, you can't have additional tables, all that's not possible. So we want a logical replication solution that allows to all that activity on the standby. There's additional reasons we streaming replication isn't suitable for every case. Primarily, it doesn't allow to cross versions. If you upgrade from 9.3 to 9.4, there's no luck because you can't use streaming replication for that, which is if you have a multi-giga uh, terabyte database, using PG dump or PG upgrade has its problems. So that's why at the moment people use Sloney, why people use Londisti. But those have the performance problems, so we want to build this to make that possibly faster. Another very common use case is cache invalidation. Say you, you don't trust your Postgres database to be to can ha handle all the requests, and instead you store put a key value store in front of it and cache data. Say you put uh, um, like a caching proxy in, in front of your website, but you might want to invalidate the data <coughs> that's in that cache. So we can create a replication stream, in the, uh, include in the output plugin, write an output plugin that only outputs the key to the cache and then in the cache just purge all the incoming data that's been changed. Another very common use case we hope to solve with it or support with it is auditing. Many installations require that all changes need to be visible in some uh, usable format, but for example, Using log statement, uh, the statement log doesn't really help with uh, that very well because it isn't a consistent order. You can't query it because it's just text. Uh, it doesn't handle upward <coughs> transactions, all that. It's also very, very expensive to log every single query. Another thing is uh, aggregating roll up. You have several databases that don't have the same schema. You have so for some odd reason, still another database in there than Postgres, and you want to update it with the new data from Postgres because it's a old, old software that's still around or similar. All that should be relatively much easier with that support. I, not yet. I think we're going to get there that we need to attach user configurable information to every transaction because obviously the username is going to be helpful. What you can do is to create uh, like a statement trigger that just every one time a transaction adds the user in there into some special table. That's obviously not very nice. I think we want more, but yeah. there was a limit to well, what we can do. Okay. I wanted to rob it not to kill me. So, uh, as I just showed before, there's a very simple SQL interface. It's just select star from get me the, all the data. And that's very simple. There's a couple of variations in there. There's a variation that says peek into the data stream, don't consume it, which is very useful if you're playing around. You can just say, what are the next 100 changes? Show me them without consuming them. There's also the version that supports outputting data in binary, which might be useful if your output plugin streams data in binary. Um, the, the problems with that are that it's relatively expensive to call that function. 
it's OK if you call it to stream out a half a gigabyte of data. But if you call it for every single change, the initiating the logical decoding process takes some time and might read data from disk repeatedly. So you probably shouldn't call that a hundred times a second. <coughs> the next part is obviously as a SQL function can't do any streaming. You can say, give me all the rows as they come in. Pretty much at the moment not solvable with a uh, SQL callable function. So those are the caveats. <laughs> so what we also have is the so-called vault sender interface that's already used for streaming replication and for PG base backup and uh, things like that. But now there's also a command that allows you to get the data in the logical format. It's pretty much the same commands you can do from SQL. It's create, it's not PG underscore drop rec, uh, create replication slot, but it's create logical replication slot in uppercase letters. Okay, and then, but the advantage of that is that it allow, streams the data as the data is produced on the primary, which is very useful because you can get the data very fast, there's no repeated startup costs, and very interestingly, it supports synchronous replication, which is something none of the trigger-based solution has figured out how to do. There is a command line utility to receive those changes. That's called PG Receive Logical. That is another thing that was repeatedly renamed. Whatever. Um, the problem with this is it uses the same protocol to get the data out that the streaming replication from a users, and it, that's basically a binary protocol. So you need to be able to say, OK, those eight bytes are an LSN. Those eight bytes are a datum, a date. And that's, so there is a bit of fiddling. I really hope that we can get uh, like a small Python library, a small Ruby library, and stuff that just gets the data in a more convenient format. But we don't have that yet. Um, yes, I have done benchmarks. So with PGBench, uh, streaming up the changes, the overhead was like 6% uh, or so. That was with because uh, like with streaming the output, I haven't compared it to streaming replication. I was just comparing to not doing this to doing it. In comparison, uh, we tried both Sloan and Lindista. They couldn't; they completely fell apart because they couldn't keep up with the uh, performance. So we had we monitored the backlog, and the backlog within 12 seconds was just never decreasing anymore in any meaningful manner, because like the overhead is so large that it just couldn't keep up. So uh, it. So I could. There was one when I streamed PG Bench. One decoding process could keep up with. Uh, I think I had done it on a system with 32 CPU uh, uh, cores, and it could keep up with that with a single decoding process. That's what I. I think there's optional for improvement there. And it very heavily depends on what your output plugin does. If your output plugin converts everything to text, it's different from when it all just streams out the data in the binary format, because that conversion from the internal format to the textual format costs has costs. So there's trade-offs to be made. And you also can do stuff in the output plugin, <laughs> say, I don't need this changes to this table. I just skip it. So what are the problems with the support that's now committed and is coming as part of 9.4? Uh, the biggest issue probably is that only committed changes are streamed. If you have a very, very large transaction, say you just restored your entire database and it's one terabyte large, nothing will happen while, those one, while that one terabyte is read. The whole data will only be streamed once the commit arrives. 
And obviously, then you're going to be busy for a while streaming out that one terabyte, because even a modern system, that takes a while. I think there's a very good case to be made that we want an interface that allows optionally to stream data out while the data is being written. The problem is that that makes the apply side very, very complex because you need to be able to deal with n open transactions at the same time and all of those might abort at some later point. And Postgres currently doesn't, as a, from the receiving end, doesn't have any infrastructure for having a single process with multiple transactions in the process at the same time. So it might, if we have the right autonomous transaction support in Postgres, this might get easier to use and that might be sufficient reason to implement it. I don't think the sender side is very complex to implement. I think the user, how the interface looks like and how to apply changes coming from that isn't going to be easy. So, and the next biggest problem that personally I find to be much bigger is that we don't replicate DDL changes itself. As you saw before, once there was no auto table in that street. What we need is the ability to say, get a command that that's does, oh, this table has been altered, the new schema looks like that and that, and the command you need to do to transform that, those two is that SQL. Luckily, Alvaro and before that, Dimitri worked on that. And we have 495, a patch that implements uh, DDL replication for most commands. The things that we don't support are create database because the whole decoding only works on a database level, so it doesn't really make sense, and create role and, so, and create table space. Basically, we don't support any of the uh, operations that are bigger than the current database have cluster level support, uh, scope. So it's going to be interesting to see whether that gets into 9.5. I'm going to fight for it. I think a couple of other people will. We'll see. Um, there's a couple of features this could very well use. For example, it would be very interesting if we had support to decode two face commit transactions separately, so when you actually get the contents of the transaction, when uh, the two-phase prepare is done, and then you can stream it to the other side, do a prepare on the other side, and only do the two-phase commit, commit prepared once the other side has successfully applied the transaction, because what that allows you to build is, as as multi-master systems that have, op have optionally syn synchronous apply in a sense. It's optimistically locked synchronous apply. That, I think, can be the basis of a very powerful set of features, but that needs to be written. Um, I think there uh, can be some interesting additional options to, that allows to specify, like we have the replication identifier that allows to specify which of the old rows are there on a per column basis to have tailor the uh, overhead to whatever your table and your application solution you needs. But those are the ones I see. So why did we went through nearly two years of work on this? Uh, the reason is we are working on a project called BDR, and that's asynchronous multi-master. And we want that to, or it's open source, and we want that to be available in Postgres. We want to put as much as we are allowed to into core Postgres because we think many of the scenarios that are coming up are much harder to do if you need to build that all yourself. And for now, all the, conf the, the conflict resolutions we are working on is last update wins. Because that's good enough for many usage scenarios. There obviously are obviously other scenarios where you can't use last update wins. That's why we support uh, conflict handlers that you can say, okay, if there has been a conflict between that and that update from two different nodes, this function gets called and the function can say, oh, this is an error, I don't replicate anymore, this is all broken, or it can say, use this tuple as a result and the conflict is resolved. It's all open source, and as I said, we are trying to get it integrated into Postgres. Uh, I have a very small demo of that. So, 
as you can see, this is one shell, this is another shell. Since I didn't want to rely on the network here, it's all on my computer, but as you can see, one port here connects to port 55441 and 40. So right now, there's a, a table and a sequence. So what I'm going to do first, that's from when I tried, uh, that it actually everything worked. So I'm going to, wait, I tried at least, drop the table, and I dropped it on this node, and now we can check, did it replicate? Yes, it did replicate, and even the sequence was dro uh, dropped as well. You can also do, have, create a new sequence, and as you see, there's a new syntax here, and that's using BDR. What that does, it uh, says we want a distributed system that works across a multi-master system. Then we create a table that comes, doesn't come out very well here, but here. We create a table talks again. This time we have a key, and that's big int, and it has defaults to next of all of the sequence we just created on the other node. It's the primary key. We also have the talk name and the description. Now I'm going to say, oh, that wasn't what I was <laughs> intending. <laughs> hmm, that worked before. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to change the owner. Supposedly that should change the owner to the table so it doesn't it gets dropped together. I'm not sure why it's not working anymore. It did when I tried it before. So um, I did now insert it to uh, rows into this, very arbitrary ones. So the uh, it's not getting wider any anymore. You have to. So now it updated those. As you can see, the voting algorithm for the sequence doesn't start at zero, but that's pretty much not a problem. So now I could start insert into talks value. Uh, hmm? Oh, thanks. So, oh, and I screwed up the, see, uh, the quote. It's very inconvenient that the screen doesn't show everything. So, and now it inserted, and it will also be visible here. Obviously, with screwed up quoting, but it should be have the same data, and as you can see. It uses different uh, ranges of rows because it got designed differently. Did you have to set up? So I can show that's basically how it works. The configuration, I think we are going to want to change that at some later point before we can convince anybody to put it into core Postgres. At the moment, uh, it's configured by doing setting some GUX. So we have uh, BDR.connections. It connects, there's a P here. There's two connections it does to other nodes. It's 5440 and 5442. So you can recognize there's a third node that I didn't have space to show on the screen. And then that's the connection that specifies to where we connect and the same if you look here, it will be very much the same. It will show, obviously, not itself because that's 5440. Obviously, it won't replicate to itself. So it has just the other two nodes in the three node configuration. And that's basically all you need to do to replicate the data between the two nodes. I think we are going to want to have something like create a uh, SQL command, top-level commands that connect to the other node, 
but there's some infrastructure required for that, and we don't want to patch code PostgreSQL any more than we want to need to. So that's the configuration we have right now because you don't need to change anything for it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm already getting close to the end. Um, I want to thank very much that Intel Security and McAfee have allowed us, Second Quadrant, to work on this. And without somebody funding it, it wouldn't be, have been possible to work two years on a feature. And I think that's the reason why all the existing logical replication solutions have used the queue table with triggers. It's just because it takes an enormous amount of time to implement anything that's better than that. And it's a very convenient solution. Um, the community for review, I started two and a half years by sending an email. Oh yeah, here's the, uh, the feature I want to work on. I want to work on Multimaster. And I think uh, in the next two months or so, there were like 400 messages. And there were lots of arguing. And, but we got very, very much better than my first approach. My first approach was kind of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> so, but. We improved on that. It was a prototype. There was, it went through lots of lots of review. And I want to particularly thank Robert here because he's, without his review, it's rather unlikely that the feature would have made it into uh, 9.4. So very many thanks to that. I was also want to thank the people that already worked on output plugins before the feature was even committed. Like Steve Singer had provided very early feedback of the API. And I have my doubts that without that feedback saying, oh, another solution than what you want to do has a chance to use this. Although that, if without that, it might have not gotten in. So thanks. And the two authors of the output plugins, are, I have to also have to thank. But they aren't here, unfortunately. And second quadrant for letting me spend far, far, far too much work on it. Yeah. It's a voting protocol. What? Voting protocol. Majority voting protocol. That's not an answer. Yeah. It, <laughs> it allow, Explain the system. So we have a new AM that for sequences, those allow another implementation of sequences. That sequence AM then internally does say, I need a new chunk of values, because at the moment I have no allocated values. Then that request gets transferred to all the other nodes in the system. They'll say, oh, I am allocating a conflicting value. Then they say, you're not allowed to use that. Or they say, uh, I don't care, use that. And then once the majority says, OK, you're allowed to use that, it starts to use the chunk. At the moment, the chunk size is hard coded to 1,000 values at a time. Um, and then you can base that we want to provide auto, ta uh, auto sequence set BDR dot batch size at some point, then you can say different batch sizes. But yeah. How, how does it know? How do the servers know which servers are sharing a particular sequence? DDL is replicated, so it's just using the same sequence name on all nodes. I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but. It's using the same configuration as the rest of the So it's a list of servers with that file. Okay. In That's the. Okay, yeah, I think it's the this was the BDR.connections I showed. It yeah. uses the same okay. cluster network that's configured there. Um, I, I would say that we'll probably want to make the chunk size configurable. <laughs> I think you're right. I am afraid there will be a couple of bigger complaints. <laughs> <laughs> well, an another approach uh, that you might want to consider would be to start the sequence on a different uh, end number and have a larger increment. <coughs> uh, that's the problem is that doesn't work very well if you add new, s uh, new nodes to the cluster. Because then you have rebalancing problems. And <coughs> so you need to have some, co you need some coherency mechanism well, to agree on a new interleave. And that's. Well, well, there are still going to be a lot of people who, are gonna be, who would be perfectly happy with that. Yeah, but the, you can just use the in built-in sequences and set auto sequence, set increment one 
or uh, three and do that? Well, I would start with 100. Yeah, yeah, but there's an API, so you can write anyone you want. You know, and if you, if oh, you're right. right. So right. what? Oh, there'll be multiple implementations. I, as a test, I now have a gapless sequence implementation that doesn't allow any gaps in sequence for local, because people asked for that and it was a nice test. But cool. so the API is pretty much next vol, reset, and all that options. So you can do what you want. The advantage of doing something like this is that you can say this local chunk that's acquired is only valid for a minute, and then you have like mostly coherent sequences across nodes. So you have can do like order by sequence, and you get a very reasonable value globally, and that can be very helpful. Yeah, it's also what we've been asked to implement. So. Yeah. 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 You can go with UUIDs. Like if, if, yeah. you really, if you really want super uniqueness, then you go UUID and you don't care about this. It's yeah. only but interesting if you want some correlation. I think I shouldn't have shown that we have distributed sequences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? How much, how much time can you spend working on that? You spent a lot of time working on distributed sequences. Didn't no, you? that was the flight to last PGCon. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. <laughs> and the flight back, I think. But, yeah. So what happens if the connection is lost between They reconnect. They reconnect and they reconnect. So, yeah, and then we retransfer it and <laughs> so what there's when you do the use the val sender uh, protocol, you can say give me all changes that are streamed after that LSN that happened after that LSN, and then on the receiving side you remember which transaction have you replayed already, and then if you disconnect, you say replay all that. We have an extension proposed to Core Postgres that allows to integrate that on the replay side automatically. So the, lo the local commit has the information which remote commit was it replaying. And so crash recovery can replay all that information. There's one particular person in this room who has doubts about that approach. Uh, you'll see, I think it's very neat and I like it, but that's because I wrote it. So. <laughs> yeah, so we have that's basically the approach. You remember how far you replayed, and then you request all those changes since the last time. And you can basically that works by every now and then, if you use the bad sender protocol, you send, say, I have received up to here. And you can't get any changes that are older. You should do it more frequently if you can. So basically, at the moment, it even asks you, please send me a feedback message now. That's all the, the Val Center protocol has that built in for streaming replication because that also wants that information. We just use this exactly the same protocol. And that's also what allows us to implement synchronous replication without any further changes. There wasn't anything we had to change for that. But yeah, that's how this works. Any other questions? Yes, um, let me. I unfortunately, uh, my computer crashed before and I lost two, three slides, so that's why that information was actually on a slide. Um, it's the PDR user guide. I'll put the uh, this link up in a second. Mm, 
that doesn't work well. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, there's the information that has a manual that has the Git repository. Uh, I think at this point you shouldn't use the BDR branch, but the BDR next branch because we've made some progress since the last release. But yeah, um, it will officially, more officially, be, re be released at char. Uh, what year do we have? 14. Um, and yes. So. Okay. To the minute.